All right, so thanks a lot and thanks for the nice invitation to this very nice workshop. Um, I thought I would talk to you today a little bit about the work we've been doing in my group, basically since we came to Bochum in 2016. So we are actually a rather young group of people um, that grew quite fast, but we are basically more or less divided in two. And this is a little maybe special compared to the terahertz community. So we come or I come from the ultra fast laser community. Um, so we have in the group basically two groups relatively distinct that collaborate together. One that really develops laser sources, ultra fast lasers, and more particularly high power ultra fast lasers, so high average power. And the other subgroup that kind of tries to adopt those sources to generate broadband terahertz radiation. Um, and then we look mostly in collaboration in using these sources for applications that require that um, high average power. And so we're happy to have many very nice collaborators. And I mean, I'm hoping from discussions, we might even add some more collaborators for people with ideas on how to use these high power sources. Um, so in principle, I mean, I'll be talking about ultra fast laser driven terahertz pulses. And I, I don't think I need to explain too much about this. But what's, I guess, important, um, these are driven by ultra short laser pulses. And these are the ones that we generate and we build the lasers from scratch. And what's important about them is, um, in order to do, um, to detect them properly, then you need few cycle pulses that are phase stable. Um, then you can detect them in the time domain in a field result fashion. And of course, since these are, um, nearly single cycle pulses, they result in very broad bandwidths, right? Um, and it's kind of commonly accepted. And the way we started this activity was it's kind of commonly accepted in the community that these are low power, right? So in the, one of the talks before, we heard like, yeah, broadband sources, their TDS is usually like 100 microwatts of power, right? And um, this comes a little bit from the front ends that are typically used for these systems. Um, depending a little bit where you come from, if you're more on the scientific application or on the industrial side or more applied side of things, um, typically you have two types of systems that are out there. Some are based on titanium sapphire amplifiers. These are mostly applications where you need high single pulse energy. Um, and these are like typically relatively large systems. Um, they can be qualified as expensive depending from where you look. Um, but typically our scientific systems, you need to tweak them. They're not necessarily super robust and typically not deployed, let's say in industrial applications. Um, on the other hand, there's these very compact, relatively inexpensive erbium fiber lasers that drive these typically commercial um, systems, right? They are compact and relatively cheap and the performance range is quite different. So you aim for typically different applications when you use these at the front end. Um, but most importantly, if you take a look at the laser that drives the terahertz generation, that's kind of the point where we started is no matter what kind of laser you use, you usually are typically limited at the front end for a laser that has maybe a watt of average power at the most. Um, and this, of course, you convert into the terahertz, and then it, this results in the famous, let's say, a milliwatt, 100 microwatts of average power in the terahertz that you start with, right? Um, so it's kind of a little bit in the, let's say, in the culture, or when you talk to people, it's like automatically, okay, the terahertz TDS is low average power. And this is where we, since we came from the high power ultra fast community, we thought maybe we could bring something to, to change this. Um, and in principle, why are people interested in high average power? So at a given pulse energy needed by a certain application, if you have higher average power, then you simply have more pulses per second. And if you have more pulses per second and you want to fix a certain measurement time, you can, you're can you simply integrating over more pulses so you get better signal to noise ratio. Or if you do single shot experiments, you're lucky enough, um, then you simply can reduce your measurement time or, or do whatever you're doing faster, right? So there is a certain interest um, in, in getting average power. And in many, many applications, this is kind of a killer. So if you have one shot every whatever millisecond um, and you need to reconstruct a very weak signal and you need to integrate for many pulses, this can result really in prohibitively long measurement times, right? So it can get like in some spectroscopy experiments up to week long um, integration times that you really need to reconstruct your signal, right? So this is can really be a game changer for experiments where you're suffering from from low signals. Um, and in principle, like we, we all base this on a very standard time domain spectrometer. So there's no real specifics here, but it's just to put everybody on board. And what we look at is the ultra short pulses that drive this. And also important here, 
is, of course, the performance um, that we use from the laser then defines the type of pulses that we get at the end. So it is kind of important, and it really helps if you know or if you have know-how on the front end of the laser, right? Not only the repetition rate, but also maybe how to tune the pulse duration, um, how to tune the pulse shape, how to tune your spectrum at the input, so that then you can tune um, your pulses. And since we're talking here about repetition rate, let's say if you have, and this is an example from one of our papers, this data here, it's exa an example where you take the same laser that you can tune in repetition rate from 40 kilohertz to 400 kilohertz with the same input pulse energy. And so you see there in the end that the single terahertz pulse you get out is pretty much the same, right? So that doesn't change. But what you get is a gain in, in signal to and dynamic range in the spectral domain, let's say. And so because you are able in a given measurement time to integrate over more pulses, right? And this is the type of things that we are looking at. This is just a kind of simple example, but to show why we, we care about having more pulses per second. Okay, and how does the situation actually look and why we thought maybe there was something to bring to this, um, to this field? If you take a look um, at the different repetition rate regions, and again, which repetition rate region you are in depends very strongly on the application that you're aiming for. Most spectroscopists, they need more single pulse energy, so they will automatically go to lower repetition rates. Um, and more people doing maybe linear spectroscopy, they will go more to this side of the repetition rate region because maybe they don't care that much about a single pulse strength, right? Um, but if you see, these are really just kind of state-of-the-art results, right? It doesn't, it's not all results of terahertz TDS out there in the labs. Um, but most of the state-of-the-art results are centered here at an average power, which is in this diagonal line, of around a milliwatt. Um, this is kind of what you find typically out there um, as a state-of-the-art. And now more and more, and what we are trying to do and what many people are trying to do is to access this line above, right? So try to approach the one watt line or above if possible, right? And this, of course, again, you can come from a world where you do spectroscopy and you can access this watt um, at one kilohertz repetition rate which with much more pulse energy, or you can address this from the very high repetition rate. You don't care so much about single pulse energy, but you get simply a significant uh, boost in number of pulses for a given pulse strength, right? So this is where we are, and what we are interested in is well, or we started kind of in a middle ground, right? So we built some lasers that operate at megahertz repetition rate, which is high for spectroscopy people, low for certain applications where people are more used to hundreds of megahertz type systems, right? So it's a bit in between and it can address both applications, but also gives possibilities to kind of expand in the in both directions as well, right? Um, okay, and so in principle, where, where we came from is in, on, in parallel to all these wonderful terahertz systems, there is a lot of progress that's been done in laser technology at the same time, right? So if you look at this graph, this is directly the terahertz emitter of these terahertz TDS sources. But if you look at the lasers, um, which is a few orders of magnitude behind, of course, because we're converting from the near infrared to the terahertz, um, you see that there are now lasers that like can go up to several kilowatts of average power with ultra short pulses, right? And these have by far not been very much exploited to generate terahertz. There is always a bit of a lag between the kind of state of the art people doing lasers and then the use of them to generate terahertz sources or whatever other secondary source. And then even another lag of a few, let's say five, 10 years, whatever it takes um, to adopt them then for applications, right? So this is where the kind of the started point. And I think um, maybe if, if this gets adopted and people start using more of these high average power technologies to generate more terahertz average power, this can maybe we can reconsider some applications that are considered like kind of taboo in the community, right? Where maybe it's like one, one got used to the fact that terahertz TDS doesn't have average power, right? And so this makes certain things difficult and maybe this can be somehow reconsidered um, with new results. So, um, the, the technology we work on, and I mentioned we build our own lasers, so we use these mode lock thin disk lasers. So in a thin disk laser, the important part is the gain medium, how you reach high average power, is mostly usually limited by the gain medium, where you have to pump, an optical pump, and then you laze in a different wavelength. And if the heat is accumulated there, you cannot scale the average power. And so in these lasers, what's special is the gain medium is in the shape of a very thin disk, and you can make a very large spot area, so it's simple thermal management, 
and plus you use a terbium doped gain media that have good thermal management additionally. So with these, you can in principle get from the laser directly very high average power oscillators, right? And this is quite unique um, to these very specific kinds of systems. You can mode lock them and right away from an oscillator get hundreds of watts out, right? So normally accepted in other technologies, say fiber oscillators, um, they're wonderful fiber lasers. And I'm not, uh, I'm not like religious about a certain technology, but I think like fiber lasers have problems with nonlinearities because of the confinements of the mode. And in this technology, your free space, you have large beams, so the average power and the energy can be scaled up quite a lot. So at the state of the art of these types of lasers, they emit at one micrometer. The average power demonstrated was up to 350 watts. Um, pulse energy is up to 80 microjoules and rep rates vary depending, you can adjust the resonator length um, from three to let's say, I mean, 100 megahertz is not impossible. This is typical values. Um, and the pulse duration, depending on the application you need, can vary from 30 to one picosecond pretty much. And usually there's a bit of a compromise to make there in power. So if you want very short pulses, typically you go down in power. So this is a little, again, application driven, what you need or want. And so when we started, we thought like, okay, we have these beautiful oscillators. Um, and so how can we start to try to see how we can take this to the terahertz? And we looked at all available techniques and we started actually with Kai-2 materials simply because they are commercially available, right? So we were new <laughs> in the community and we thought this is a good way to start. We have a decent amount of pulse energy and we have very high repetition rate compared to typical people doing optical rectification. So let's get started there. And this is basically the, where, where we started and where I present a few results now, but it's not exclusive, right? There's no good reason why this should be the only, the only good direction into one should go to. I think all of them have good, um, possible application areas where one could use these very high dri driving powers to increase the, um, the available terahertz power. Okay, and this is where, therefore, we, we started with a few experiments. And I mean, just to, to say where which applications motivated us in the beginning. So we are basically part of two collaborative centers. One of them is Resolve. It's an excellence cluster of chemists in which they're trying to explore um, water and, uh, well, solvents in general, but water being one of the most difficult ones at the microscopic level, right? And terahertz is kind of known to be a good tool to do that, but it's extremely difficult to do good experimental setups because of the very high absorption. So average power there really helps you, right? So this is one application scenario where we're working on with our new sources. And the other one, um, more applied in our collaborative research center, Marie, um, where we're trying to do imaging uh, with these high power sources, right? And so these are the two, and there's a few more, but these are the ones, let's say, that motivated us from the beginning to investigate this. Um, so I'd now get started. The workhorse laser that we built in our lab, right? This is a thin disk laser, mode locked. It's basically like any um, mode locked oscillator that you find out there. It's kind of textbook mode locking. Nothing too fancy, just the gain medium is a disk and used kind of in reflection, so it has very good thermal properties. And the output of the laser that you get, and this is... From the numbers I showed you before, it's kind of in the middle range, right? So we didn't build it to have like the absolute power record, but we built it to be able to turn it on and off in the morning and use it. <laughs> um, and I mean, one important thing about these is, of course, there are other technologies with which you could reach this regime, but this one, um, you get these very nice, clean mode locked pulses, right? For doing nonlinear optics, this is like a huge kind of un unappreciated, I would say, advantage. You get such clean, solid and pulses. For a certain pulse duration, you get the narrowest possible bandwidth, which helps a lot for phase matching. It helps a lot for nonlinear conversion, right? So this is one, let's say, subtle beauty of these oscillators compared to, let's say, MOPA-type architectures for reaching this type of average power. And so the laser we built was this 125 watts, 10 microjoules around, and 13 megahertz rep rate. See, the pulse duration is not very short, so we had to work um, a little bit to shorten it. Um, there are now techniques that you can do to shorten these pulses down to the sub-100 femtosecond range, right? And this was for very long, and in my opinion, one of the reasons why people it took long to adopt these kind of iterbium high power technologies is, especially in scientific applications, you need shorter pulses than 500 femtoseconds. And for very long, it was difficult to get there. Um, but now there are these extremely efficient techniques to compress pulses, and including this multipass cell compression technique in which you basically just free space broaden the spectrum of your laser 
and then compress it back with just dispersive mirrors. And in that way, you can, with like 90% efficiency, you see we start with 120 watts and then we end with 110, but basically we lost nothing and we gained hugely in pulse duration and in peak power, right? So this is pretty nice. Um, it's, it's, let's say, in my opinion, it's been pretty much of a game changer on adopting these lasers for, for applications. Um, and so we started with GAP and GAP, uh, the reason why we did that was just it's phase matched at room temperature and collinearly with 1030 nanometers. So this helps a lot to get started. Um, and so we started and, and we thought like, well, okay, we know the limitations, low uh, nonlinear coefficient. The conversion will not probably not be record high, but we will learn about the different trade-offs, thermal effects, et cetera. And surprisingly, um, the material holds um, the whole power. So we were actually quite surprised that we can make it really hold the whole 100 watt beam. Um, with intensities that are typical for doing optical rectification, right? So the conversion efficiencies we get, 10 to the minus five are typical um, for other low power sources. So this didn't change much. And we end up with this nice kind of milliwatt level uh, broadband source, which is in the end very nice, but well, we have 100 watts at the input, right? So it's, it's, it was more of an exploratory starting work. Still, the source is quite nice um, and can be used for a lot of nice experiments. And just to show you, I mean, I won't show you this for all the experimental um, techniques that we have, but this is the kind of problems we have to face, right? So we have these very high average driving powers. And so we need to understand what's happening with these conversion materials when you shoot 100 watts on them with a laser, right? And part of it is exploring thermal effects. And this can be nicely done, for example, in a cryogenic chamber where you can control the temperature very nicely. And this you can do in any material that you have available that you want to know how to scale in power. Um, first of all, we had to explore. There was no literature on the refractive index change with temperature. We know we're heating up the material quite a lot. Um, so we wanted to know how much the refractive index was changing. We measured this with our TDS. Um, we also explored what happened with the bandwidth. As you cool down the material, as expected, things get more broadband. This is not no surprise. But the nicest thing of all, and you, we wanted to understand what was limiting us. Was it linear absorption because of the average power or was it nonlinear absorption, which is typical for these kind of femtosecond lasers, right? At this average power and high rep rate, it was unclear to us. Um, and this was possible to do. It's actually a quite nice experiment. It's, so you have a cryo chamber, so you know exactly how much heat you are depositing by looking at the difference, how much it takes you to maintain a temperature while the laser is on the crystal, right? So you can do this as difference between a continuous wave laser and a mode locked laser. And then you see that most of the absorbed power comes from nonlinear absorption. So we knew then that what was limiting us was like in all other low average power regions, um, multi-photon absorption in gap. So what, so good we learned something. I mean, I would say these are not like hero results, but it's quite nice. And I mean, many times also, one thing that's maybe not appreciated, other techniques might give you higher conversion efficiency, but if you reach much narrower bandwidth pulses, then the peak power also goes down, right? So you might be better off with a one milliwatt broadband source as available with gallium phosphide than with a lithium niobate source that gives you 10 times more efficiency, but your terahertz pulses are much longer, right? So this is something, again, um, has to see from the application what is better. Um, and so, of course, we, we were looking at reaching higher efficiencies, so we explored also tilted pulse from regime, which is kind of an obvious choice, knowing the literature, people do this at much higher energies normally and high average and low average power with typical titanium sapphire lasers, right? And this is an attractive uh, path to take because lithium niobate has a much higher nonlinear coefficient and it's a dielectric, so it should have these multi-photon absorption problems. Um, but of course, then phase matching or velocity matching in this case requires tilting the pulse because the difference in refractive index is huge between the near infrared and the terahertz. So this kind of tilted pulse front you can do with a grading and it's, it works, but the experimental complexity becomes much higher. Um, but we were quite motivated by the 1% efficiencies demonstrated at lower energy. And so we managed to get some pretty nice results out of this, um, using our 100 watt oscillator. Uh, at 13 megahertz, so we get 66 milliwatts out. This is at 13 megahertz, so again, to be measured against uh, what people do at one kilohertz, right? Um, the fields are in the tens of kilovolts per centimeter, not optimized, so this is what we get by focusing down just normally. Um, and technically, this is easy to scale up. Um, we've pretty much studied everything there is to study on how this is working in our case. 
We've done really some crazy simulations on how to do this properly. And what we're suffering from is really we have not enough average power or <laughs> not enough pulse energy to drive this process. So the tilted pulse front works much better if you have a millijoule pulse energy than 10 microjoules. So if we had a kilowatt oscillator with 13 megahertz, this would be a lot easier and the efficiency would scale accordingly. So this would be, this is what we learned and this is where we're going for now. Either high average power or maybe a little lower repetition rate. Maybe three megahertz would be great. This is, we'll see. And just for benchmarking, I mean, I never want to offend anyone, right? So I just went, because in principle from the scientific side, it's a, like a little, where people go when they need average power is to these accelerator sources and just looked online, like what parameters are offered. Of course, they have much more tunability and there's other parameters where where it's still nice to go to an accelerator, right? I don't mean to say that I can replace accelerators, but it's a little bit the direction that this is taking, right? So you have these very high average power lasers and the demonstrations are going towards that direction. And so we are not completely not competitive, right? With such sources. You have to see, of course, again, if you need a lot of fields, then we're still a little bit behind. Um, and we look a lot at detection, so it was told in the other, so it's nice to have average power, but if your dynamic range doesn't show the average power, then there's kind of no point. Um, so we work a lot on trying to use that average power for increasing in combination with sensitive detectors for really seeing that extra 20 dB, 30 dB that we gain from the average power, right? Um, right now, we are at a point where the detectors need to be, for example, these photoconductive antenna detectors, they need to be rethought because of the new wavelength. And so we are pretty much at the state of the art, but we don't see yet the extra 30 dB, right? So there's still work to do, which is great for us because there's still work to do. We still tested them. And I think nobody had ever really tested these with like, I don't know, 25 milliwatts of terahertz power, right? So this gives us um, reasons to, to continue exploring. Um, and just to show you a little bit the advantages, we did this very nice first experiment. It's kind of a super basic experiment. I guess most of you know like super fancy imaging techniques, but it was just basically to show what one can do if you have average power. So it's a basic imaging experiment of a 3D printed sample. Um, and we basically just shine like a torch or high power terahertz beam onto the sample and we rotate it. And then we put the detector at a fixed position and then can reconstruct um, just the object, right? And I mean, you see right away, we tried to do this in a fair way, right? We took a commercial terahertz TDS in our source. Um, in a fair way, I mean, at a constant measurement time, right? Because of course, you can always normalize to the number of pulses, right? But of course, that's not fair. What you want is a short measurement time for such an experiment. So we took the same measurement time for both. And you see that we can reconstruct, of course, the image much better. All this scales with power. And of course, since we're doing this in reflection, we get nothing reflected because it's a piece of plastic. So this is a case where you really need power. And I mean, just to point out that this is very basic, we took basically an unoptimized detector for the wrong wavelength, right? Because we didn't have 1030 PCAs at the time. Um, we had an order of magnitude less repetition rate, which then doesn't speak for signal to noise ratio. Um, we had much longer pulses, which in this type of measurements leads normally to poorer resolution. So we had, a, everything was kind of playing against us and still the power helps, right? So this is kind of a, an, a demonstration that although the dynamic range is not there on paper when you shoot the full power on the detector, the dynamic range is there <laughs> because you see the better image, right? So this is, I think, just speaking for, for there's a huge potential for improvement. I think one can make much nicer measurements, much faster measurements, right? Um, and of course, I mean, many people are looking for broader bandwidths even. Lithium niobate stops pretty much at two terahertz. Uh, we looked at these organic crystals, um, that most people, when you tell them organic crystals and high average power is like, there's some kind of explosive allergic reaction that like, uh, doesn't go together because organic crystals are basically plastics. I mean, they just like melt under your eyes when you look at them. Um, so they're, they're not meant for this, but actually there is a way to make them work at high average power. So you just need to match the burst length of your femtosecond pulses with the thermal, um, relaxation coefficient, basically, right? So you can make this work if you chop your beam properly. So, and this is anyway something you do typically to do lock-in detection. So this works. And this, we were quite surprised to find this out that you can make this work and very efficiently because these crystals are broadband and are very efficient. So we made this work, for example, with a laser power of 24 watts, 10% duty cycle, 2.4 watts on the crystal. Then we get the same milliwatt that we were getting with gap with 100 watts on, right? 
So these are really beautiful crystals. I mean, they're, they're kind of like, yeah, still kind of experimental, I would say, but it leads to very nice results. And then, of course, you get much broader bandwidths. Um, and I mean, I'm almost done. I just wanted to say like this, we, we actually did most of this work with our oscillator because we had the oscillator and we built it ourselves. So we had full control on it. But for people who like uh, are scared of like a home built uh, fancy laser, we started looking into um, commercial lasers, right? There are people using these high rep rate terbium lasers for micro machining applications and they are cheap and very compact and very robust, right? So, and with these type of lasers, we get now routinely like tens of milliwatts of average power. Okay, we're not at 13 megahertz anymore, now 400 kilohertz. So this is very nice, right? So this is, and this is really a laser that's super robust, right? And for micro machining applications, the nice thing is like they're tunable in rep rate. They are like, uh, you can put them in an oven, you can put them wherever, right? And this is, so this is, I think, let's say for, maybe for applications on the first degree, the most promising direction, right? If you can tolerate the 400 kilohertz and not have to go to such high repetition rates. Um, and same thing with other crystals, right? So you can start the story all over again. If you don't want to use fancy 100 watt laser, you can use commercial lasers. There's really robust systems out there. And with these organic crystals, even you get these super broad bandwidths in very short times um, that, that you can get because of the power, right? So I think this is pretty much it. Um, I'm looking for people who want to apply these systems. So we really like developing the sources, right? We have a few collaboration partners, but this I think is the perfect audience, right? If you have an application scenario where maybe the power is really kind of the, the killer thing, then come to me, we can discuss to do common experiments. I think they're kind of waiting to shine these, these systems, right? Um, and more applications than just our, our first imaging experiments. Um, so that's it. And thanks a lot.